Well, welcome to our Pastor's Wednesday night Bible study. It's been a while since we've gathered together, and I kind of have to get back into my groove of uh, doing this process, speaking into a camera, but hopefully speaking into your life and my life from the Word of God. This is really a study, and so I make no apology for it. This is not always a lighthearted moment. It's, it's an opportunity for us to dig a little bit deeper and to look in scriptures that uh, maybe for some of us we haven't spent a lot of time on. And I love to do that. Uh, sometimes on Sunday morning you can't go into some of the passages that we're going to be looking at in the course of the next couple of months. And so this provides an opportunity for those who really like to dig a little bit deeper, look and be a student of the Word of God in a, in a more significant way than what we can cover on a Sunday morning. So that's what this is all about. And so it's the Wednesday night pastor's Bible study. And I'm picking up where we left off last time, but tonight I want to do something a little bit different from learning from the Bible that Jesus used. I'd like to pick up again on his last words as he was about to enter into heaven and the ascension. Just before that, he said these wonderful pass this wonderful passage in Luke where he talks to his disciples and he said, to, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me and the three portions of the Old Testament, to remind you of that, the three portions of the Old Testament, as they had it, this is the Bible that Jesus used, included the Law of Moses, uh, which is the first five books of the Bible. We talked about that. It's called the Pentateuch as well. And uh, then there are the books of the prophets and people like Isaiah. And next Wednesday night, we'll look at the prophet of Joel. Uh, these are difficult books to study, but that's part of this Bible that Jesus used. And then the Psalms. The Psalms is really the collection of all the poetic books which includes Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and in particular the Psalms that we'll look at here tonight. So that's the section. This is the way he wanted to open their minds. He wanted them to see these things in new lights. And that's what I'm trying to do on this Wednesday night study, to open our minds to some things that maybe we've not seen before. Maybe we've read the passage, but we didn't see some things in the passage that perhaps God would want us to see. And maybe that's some of the stuff that Jesus talked to his disciples about. So we want to explore that together. Now, here is the sections that uh, Jesus just talked about. We've gone over that before, so I'm not going to spend any time. But I want to raise this question. The Psalms are filled with a lot of really tough talk to God. In one portion, one of the psalmists says, Wake up, God. We, we need for you to do something. So it's intriguing to me that we live in a society right now with you got the COVID, you got the elections, a Supreme Court nominee, maybe, maybe not. Uh, there's a lot of racial tension and there's fights for justice. There's just a whole lot of things that are bubbling up all around us. If you read the news at all, that's constantly in front of us. And so I thought it would be intriguing to look at a passage that goes back to an era when people were still wrestling with the community that's around them and some of the issues that surround them. It comes out of Psalm 83. I can just look at a couple of Psalms here and then dig into one Psalm in particular. But Psalm 83 says this, O God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent. And O God, do not be still. I mean, how often do you think, God, where are you in the midst of some of the things that are going on Maybe in your personal life, sometimes it's a battle of, of some sort of disease or a marriage or finance or loss of a job, some, some children that we are really very concerned about. Where are you, God? Don't remain quiet. God, I want you to address this. I don't want you to be silent. Why are you silent? Some of the intriguing things that happens in the psalmist, uh, as this psalmist writes, is that God does seem silent. God does seem still. God sometimes seems very quiet. When you want him to speak up, stand up, address the issue, and help us get through it. Because he's talking about the enemies. They make an uproar. God, where are you in response to some of these conditions that we're dealing with? And one of the things that we learn in the book of Psalms is that God sometimes does seem hidden. He does seem quiet. And one of the reasons for that is that God wants to invite us into his world. When God is silent, it causes me to want to lean forward to engage him even more, to talk to him even more, to appeal to him, and to say what the psalmist says. You know, wake up, Lord. Don't you see what's going on? So these are, these are very real, emotional, you know, calling out to God in the psalms. And this particular psalm helps to tee that up. 
because God wants to invite us into his world. There are things in the scriptures that God wants to reveal to us, and sometimes they are hidden, that God is speaking to us in ways that we maybe haven't seen it before. So I'd like to use these Wednesday nights to, to di dive into passages that maybe we've read, maybe we've never read, but either way, to be able to look at passages of Scripture that are very confusing or totally misunderstood, but allow God to speak, to allow God to no longer be quiet, that He is not being still, but that He is doing something. One of the passages that helps us to understand that is, is where Jesus was dying upon the cross. And Jesus quotes from the Psalm 22. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, Jesus had that moment. God, God, where are you in this moment? I'm dying up here on the cross. And he quotes Psalm 22. Well, when the psalmist wrote Psalm 22, did he know that Jesus was going to say that on the cross? No. But now that we look back through the eyes of Jesus, we say, well, well God was in control. Way back in that era, maybe 1,000 B.C., God already knew that this would be something that Jesus would be quoting. So there is this hidden truth about Jesus in Psalm 22 that we only know in light of Christ and his death upon the cross. Psalm 73 is another interesting psalm. In this psalm, it deals with a lot of really fascinating things that would really would be worthy of your time to read through it. But in Psalm 73, verses 16 through 18, it says this, When I pondered to understand this, to understand, God, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why aren't you doing something? Why aren't you dealing with some of the issues that we're dealing with? It seems as though you're silent, you're still, you're quiet. Well, here's what the psalmist says. While I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until, until what? I came into the sanctuary of God. So what God loves to do is to remain silent still and maybe sometimes in a, not in some sort of mean way, but allow us to be a little bit confused as we seek him but struggle to find him. Because he says, I want to invite you into my sanctuary. I want to invite you into my presence. I want you to hear from me, maybe in a new way that you might not have heard from me before. One of the things we learned from the book of Hosea is that when the people became satisfied because God had blessed them and prospered them, when they became satisfied, they forgot God. So sometimes God allows this sort of this, this quietness and this hiddenness and this frustration to sort of surround us so that we re-enter the sanctuary of God because then it's no longer troublesome once I begin to hear from Him. So all that is a setup because I want us to look at a psalm in particular, Psalm 45. Psalm 45 was written a long time ago. We don't know who wrote it. Probably hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It wasn't written by King David, but it speaks about King David. So Psalm 45 is a, is a good example of finding Jesus in passages that otherwise I would never have thought that he is there. Let me read Psalm 45. I encourage you to have it in your Bibles. I encourage you to have your Bible in your hand as I talk here as well. But here's Psalm 45. There's the opening a little paragraph of, really in the Hebrew Bible, the opening thing of the choir director according to Shoshanim, a maskil, the sons of Korah, a song of love. That's actually verse 1 in the Hebrew Bible. But in our English Bible, verse 1 begins this way. My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. In your splendor and your majesty, and in your majesty ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp. The peoples fall under you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of right, uh, uprightness in this, is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Out of the ivory palaces, stringed instruments have made you glad. King's daughters are among your noble ladies. At your right hand stands the queen in the gold of Ophir. Listen, O daughter, 
Give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty because he is our Lord. Bow down to him. The daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is interwoven with gold. She will be led to the king in embroidered work. The virgins, her companions who follow her, will be brought to you. They will be led forth with gladness and rejoicing. They will enter into the king's palace. In place of your fathers will be your sons. You shall make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the peoples will give thanks forever and ever. Now, you may be asking the questions I asked when I read that for the first time. What is going on here? How is that helpful for us today in the midst of some of the challenges that we face and some of the blessings that we experience as well? Psalm 45 is written to honor a king who is about to marry his bride. The first opening verses, about the first nine verses, it's all about the king. And then in verse 10 or so, it begins to talk about the bride. So here's the king and the bride coming together. And this psalmist, the sons of Korah, they write this in celebration of this king and his upcoming wedding. So it's a great celebration. And so as you read it, it sounds like, well, that's a nice thing. It's nice for whatever that king was. Was it King David? Was it some other king? What was going on there is, is, is sort of irrelevant to me because I don't quite get it. And yet there's something that's fascinating about this passage and many Old Testament passages that I want to continue to emphasize and that we're going to emphasize in the next couple of months as we go through these studies together. And that is this point, that there are many passages in the Old Testament that upon basic reading, cursory reading, just seems sort of irrelevant to us. But once you begin to dig a little bit deeper, once you say, God, let me see some things that maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing and I need to understand that, you begin to see that this is more than just something that happened in the society of that contemporary writer. It's actually something that is revealing about Jesus and that Jesus is from the Old Testament to the New Testament preeminent throughout the passages of Scripture. And until we understand Scripture as something that is all about Jesus, whether Old Testament or New Testament, we are missing much of what God would want us to enjoy. So let's dig a little bit deeper in this passage, and let me show you some things. In fact, I mentioned, I should have mentioned earlier, there is an outline on the website, and uh, you can use that to follow along as we go through it. But notice some of these characteristics that were written for the contemporary king of that time when the psalm was written. Well, that is this, that the king comes with lips of grace. Verse 2 says, You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. So whoever this king is, maybe King David, is talking about how gracious he was in his words. And yet when we look at the life of Jesus, Christ comes to us with words of grace and truth. John 1.14, there's many passages, but I include this one. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. Glories are the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So when we begin to see this psalm in light of Christ, we begin to think, well, maybe the king is not just a king in that era, but maybe it's helping us to understand the king of today, King Jesus, because King Jesus has lips of grace. We also go on and we see in this particular passage in Luke 2.40 that Jesus as a little kid, he grew up. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So the King Jesus, even as a child, was known for his gracious ways. Wouldn't you love to have one of your kids be super gracious even when they're a terrible two? That's what Jesus was, and I don't fully understand that, but that's how God raised his son, to be a son full of grace. The king here in this passage, then going back to the days that the psalmist was written, the psalm was written in Psalm 45, verse 4, the king comes as a meek and gentle king. In your majesty, ride on victoriously. For the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness, let your, let your right hand teach you awesome things. Well, this king was a righteous king, but he came in meekness, or he came in humility or gentleness. As we look at this psalm in light of Jesus, we see just what well, Jesus came as a king, but he came in meekness and humility. He rides a colt. He rides a donkey. 
he comes and is born and lives in, a, in Bethlehem and then lives in a town of Nazareth where no good thing can come from there. There's that humility that Philippians 2 talks about, that he was born as a bondservant. He wasn't born with privilege. Well, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 describes Jesus in this way, who Christ talks this way about himself. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will have this blessing of God's provision for you. So Jesus comes in meekness. The king comes to receive his bride. And this becomes even clearer that it's about Jesus Christ, the psalm that is written. In Psalm 45, 11 through 15, it talks this way. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is interwoven with gold. She is beautiful, radiant in the, the way that she is prepared for this wedding day. And then it says, she will be led to the king. Embroidered work. The virgins, her companions, will follow. So here is this bride that has been made ready for the king. And the king comes to receive his bride. Well, those of us who have studied these things, we begin to say, well, well I think I'm beginning to understand this. Because Jesus has come with the idea that Israel was his bride. Isaiah 61 says, I will rejoice greatly in my Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Notice that parallel, the garments that she wore and the garments that Israel was given, the garments of salvation. For he has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Can you imagine that God sees you and me with robes of righteousness when we know ourselves, we know what's in our heart? And that's how God says, you are my bride. He says this to Israel, first of all, you are my bride. As a bridegroom decks himself with garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. So God saw through Christ Israel as his bride, and Jesus is the, now the bridegroom. But not just Israel, but the church. We know that the church is the bride of Christ. Ephesians says this, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, uses this wonderful metaphor of a husband and a wife as the relationship of Christ and the church, the bride and the bridegroom. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, purify her, cleanse her, make the bride ready for the king. That's, that's what we are as a church. We're being made ready for the king to come and receive us to himself. And it says, though that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, the radiant glory, like the bride of Psalm 45. She's had this all embroidered beauty that's been wrapped around her. Jesus is preparing us for that king when he wants to return and receive us to himself. And it says, so that we have no wrinkle or any such thing, but that we would be holy and blameless before him. It's hard for me to fathom that Jesus sees me as a bride, a bride that is blameless, spotless, that is pure, that is cleansed and holy. Amazing. So this psalm, Psalm 45, tees up this beautiful imagery that is now being lived out in our lives because the king of Psalm 45 is really the king Jesus to you and me who put our faith in him. But not only that, one of the other great things about this king Jesus is the first time he came, he made us his bride, and now he is preparing us for a wedding. Our time on earth is not just about us, it's about him and an event that he wants us to be part of. And that event is a wedding. You know, brides, they spend a lot of time preparing for a wedding. They pamper themselves, and rightly so. Uh, their parents will spend a lot of money to get that bride ready. And our time on earth right now is an investment in our spiritual purity so that we are ready for when the king comes and brings us to that wedding day. And Revelation 19 is all about that. The second coming of Jesus Christ not emphasized enough in the church today, in my conviction, but the second coming of Jesus is all about what we're getting ready for. It says in Revelation 19, 7 through 10, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, to God. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride, that's you and me and the church, we are the bride now. We're the bride of Psalm 45, embroidered, beauty, glory. And now He says, I am the bride that Jesus is coming back 
He is the king coming for his bride. And he says, has made herself ready. On earth, you and I, if we're students of the word of God and we love Jesus, we're constantly making ourselves ready for the wedding day with Jesus. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, and for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You see, it's given to us. It's not something we earn or gain, but he gives to us this beauty of righteousness so that we are ready for the king when the king comes to receive us to himself. And then that king will rule in righteousness. In Psalm 45, it says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with oil of joy above your fellows. This is a wonderful passage. It's referring to the rule of Jesus Christ. Someday, as Jesus comes back, he takes us as his bride. We have that wedding celebration of heaven of joy and gladness, purity and holiness and uprightness. We do all that, and then the king rules in righteousness. As a new kingdom is established on earth, Jesus will be that king to rule in righteousness. He will be the benevolent dictator as we go into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So you can see how Psalm 45, again, you're always going to go back. Psalm 45 is setting up something that psalmist probably, as he wrote those words, had no idea that this is really revealing a bigger plan that God has. And this is the key that I want us to understand, sort of a bigger picture issue, that so many of God's scriptures have a bigger story that he wants to reveal to us. They aren't just nice little verses that I put on a magnet on my refrigerator. But in total, we find these passages are actually speaking to a larger story of what God is doing. And Psalm 45 is not speaking to a king and a bride in that day as much as he's saying, I want you to see the bigger picture of the king, Jesus, as he comes for his bride and comes back to earth to rule in righteousness. And one of the ways that we know that this passage, Psalm 45, was intended for you and me today and for the future rule of Jesus is because it was quoted in Hebrews chapter 1. The author of Hebrews says, the Holy Spirit gave to the author of Hebrews this insight about Psalm 45. He quotes Psalm 45. So in Hebrews chapter 1, we've been through this book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings. In Hebrews 1, it says, but of the Son. Now notice, the book of Hebrews is saying, Psalm 45 is about the Son, Jesus Christ. That Jesus is superior to angels. He's superior to all things. That's that's kind of the bigger picture of Hebrews. But what he is indicating about the Son, Jesus Christ, is who he really is. Of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So the book of Hebrews assumes and states clearly that Jesus the Son is actually God. And so it's another proof that he is deity. He is the king, and he has a throne, and he will rule forever and ever. He is eternal from past into the future. There is no coming and going of Jesus' life. And so he says of the Son, that the Son is the God, who is the God, the only God, who will rule forever and ever. And he goes on to say, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. He has come, he is coming back to establish this kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So here's where we we really crystallize the fact that this psalm is really intended by God, written hundreds and hundreds of years ago, as a passage that speaks to you and me about Jesus, who is our King. So I don't want these Old Testament passages that sometimes we just don't want to spend a lot of time to study in to be lost on us, that often they are speaking to issues of us today, And that when we say, God, where are you? Why are you quiet? Why are you silent? He says, I'm speaking to a lot of things to you. And I invite you to come into my scriptures with a desire to seek new insights that maybe maybe you know, maybe uh, you need to be reminded of, or maybe you've never heard before. So Psalm 45 is a great illustration that when we think, where are you, God? He says, well, I'm right there. Just dig a little bit. You're going to see that I'm, I'm doing something bigger than just a Psalm 45, King and Bride. I'm actually telling you a story of what my plans are for this world. 
So the king comes, he establishes his rule and righteousness. And the king of Psalm 45, it says, In the place of your fathers will be your sons, and you shall make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the peoples will give you thanks forever and ever. So Jesus, the king, the king, not the king of Psalm 45, but the king that is being referenced in a broader picture, he, he wants to reach people of every nation, every people group. And indeed, he will do that. When he comes back, it's going to be revealed in heaven that there's this great diversity of all people that are in heaven. Revelation 7 is a great example of that. It says, All after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count. So heaven is bigger than a number. You know, we just can't count how many people are going to be there. From every nation, every single nation, in all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So Psalm 45 is speaking about a king that lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But more importantly, it's speaking about the king that wants to have a reach of righteousness into every single nation, tribe, tongue, and people group. And that's where you and I, for the cause of reach and missions, help to facilitate that as we give and as we pray and as we support our missionaries, that it goes around the world as Wycliffe gets this, this scriptures into languages of people that need to hear it and to understand it. So that's where we fit in. Acts 1.8 reaffirms that when Jesus is just about to ascend up into heaven. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So God has a big plan. Now, let me just wrap up with this last verse. We've been in the book of Hebrews on Sunday morning, so I picked this one out, but there's many other passages I could have used. And I think I'll list them on the outline of seeking the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11 says, I want you to seek me with all your heart. He says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For it is he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. I like that. If I seek you, Lord, you will reward me. So my invitation is as we go through these books that we're going to be looking at, I encourage you to be a student, to be a seeker, to, to say, God, give me the depth of the truth that is there because I want to be rewarded. Now, that's not to be selfish, but that it's a beautiful blessing that God wants to give to us. I love to see things in Scripture. Every time I go into passages, I think, I'm reading through the book of Psalms now in my own private time. And so many times I, I read a psalm and say, I feel like I've read this for the very first time. There's, there's things that I missed the first half a dozen times that I've been through it. And that God loves to constantly reward us with a beautiful discovery of truth and understanding to know that, God, you're not hidden. You're not quiet. You're not still. We will ask that like the psalmist of 83. Yeah, we'll be frustrated. But what he's doing is he says, I want to... I want to just step back and allow you to step forward to me and seek me. And read other passages, Jeremiah, Proverbs 8, 17, other passages there. They constantly ask us to seek him. So as we go through these next few months, I invite you to seek him with me. As I study the Word of God, I want you to be a student of the Word as well. And next Wednesday night, we're going to be studying one of the most difficult books, I think, in the Old Testament. It's the book of Joel. It's only three chapters, but read through it. See what you think. I want to bring to us the understanding of Christ as the book of Joel is unfolding before us. So let's seek Jesus in the book of Joel next Wednesday night. So please join us if you would. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for how precious it is and what depth and richness there is for us who begin to get be, be rewarded by you as we seek you in your word, as we seek you in life. God, help us to always seek you as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.